<clears throat> oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me where the home, where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of a land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, the land of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smiles drive their sorrows all away. And they tell me that no tears will ever come again. In that lovely land of unclouded day, oh, the land of an unclouded day, oh, the land of an unclouded day, oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise, oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. All right, we'd like you to open up your Bible to the book of Titus. We uh, did a study, we've been doing a study in the book of Titus, and this past Wednesday night, uh, Brother Wilson wasn't able to record it, and, uh, but there were, some, uh, there were some things that I wanted to say from the text. I wanted to do an exposition of, of the verses and... So today we're going to look at that. I'd like you to read with me, if you will, in your Bible, the book of Titus, chapter 3. And we're going to read starting in verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and to powers and to obey magistrates and to be ready to every good work. Verse 1 tells us we ought to be good citizens, uh, even though we may not agree with who is in power. The Bible teaches us that God sets men up, takes men down. Sometimes God allows men to be in authority to bring judgment upon us uh, because of the sin that we've committed as a nation, the rebellion against God. Uh, just in the day of Nehemiah, the same was true. And he says to speak evil of no man, be no brawler, but gentle, and showing all meekness unto all men. We have to be very careful about the words we use, and uh, whatever we may say about a person, we need to make sure that what we say is not an evil thing, but a truthful thing. And uh, we're not to be involved in that which is physical, brawling, fighting, and we're to be gentle. Brother Chapman read in his Sunday school lesson in uh, uh, the Psalms, what was it Psalm 19, the gentleness of the Lord, David said it made him great. And uh, learn to be gentle. Be gentle with, you know, sometimes, you know, I had two sisters and we didn't always get along when we were growing up. And sometimes we'd get into it and... Uh, my mom would always tell me, now, son, you're stronger than your, your sisters. And I'd say, I'm not stronger than them, mom. She'd say, yeah, you are. You're a boy. Your, your bones are bigger. 
and you can hurt your sisters. And even though my mom at the time didn't know the Lord, uh, she instilled that within me. And uh, so be gentle to your wife, be gentle to your husband, be gentle with your children, uh, do your very best to be kind, and to show meekness. Notice this, unto all men. Uh, the world doesn't do this today. Everybody thinks they're a big shot. Everybody thinks they're a movie star. Everybody thinks that because they're in some position of authority that they're something else. No, they're not. If they really truly had the right attitude, they would be meek toward all men. And even, uh, you know, we, we put these people up on pedestals and we build them up with such esteem and then when they come falling down, which we knew would happen, then we wonder why they're human. But uh, without Christ, men cannot honor him. But we are to be meek toward all men. Try your very best. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. We were disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now that's a general description of mankind when he's lost. This is when man is in his natural estate. <clears throat> Excuse me. He doesn't know how to please God. And so he goes about following the flesh. But the Bible tells us that if you are a child of God, God puts within your heart a new nature. And uh, you don't live like the world. You live like a child of God. Amen. And let me tell you something. If you don't live for Christ, and if your life doesn't show fruit that you've been changed, why do you think you're saved? You're not saved if your life has not been changed. If you don't live a life of fruitfulness and faithfulness to God, then evidently your profession was a false profession of faith. Because remember, we're warned about that many times throughout the Bible. So he says, but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior, uh, but after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. That is when God in the fullness of time sent forth his son, uh, born of a virgin, made under the law. He came to this earth. And God showed great mercy and kindness to man in that he sent him a redeemer. And Christ came to do that. And now he tells us how we obtained that, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us by the washing of regeneration. That is, when, when you are regenerated, when you're born again, uh, when you're redeemed, there is a washing that takes place. There is a purification, a cleansing that takes place in your life. And the Bible tells us there is a renewing of the Holy Ghost. It turns you into a new man. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is, if you're in Christ, you've been changed, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou notice affirm constantly something that you're to repeat, something that you are to emphasize, something that you are to make sure you talk about it often. You are to uh, constantly affirm these things, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now, everything he says in verse 8 is in context with what he has said from verse 1 and verse 7. 
So all of these things should be present in your life, and these things we are to constantly affirm that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now the word careful is uh, it's used in about three or four different ways in the New Testament. There's one verse that says, Be careful for nothing, but in all things, uh, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. But here we have, uh, we have it said in a positive way that we be careful, that we, that we guard, that we watch, that we examine. Remember Paul says that we ought to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. Because you know a lot of people, they'll claim, like Judas, Judas saw the miracles, Judas bore the bags, so evidently they thought that he was a good man and he was the treasurer of the first church that Jesus started. But come to find out, uh, he was demon-possessed. He was a devil himself. And he ended up taking his own life because he did not know Christ. And I believe that God chose him in the twelve to show us that many times people will boast of being saved, but they have no fruits that it is true. Why in the world can you say, well, I've, I'm saved when you haven't been to church in years? When you haven't been to church, when, when you're not faithful, when you don't read your Bible, when you don't pray, when, when you don't tithe, when you don't give to God, when you don't put God first in your life, what gives us the right to claim that? If I say that I'm uh, in some organization, let's say that I'm a member of the Red Cross, you know, the Red Cross constantly will send me things about making donations. And, and if I were to join the Red Cross, and I would go and volunteer and do things with the Red Cross, people there would know that I was a part of the Red Cross, that I was sending money and I was working and doing all that. But when you claim to be a Christian and you claim that you know Christ, then there are some prerequisites that will follow if you truly belong to Christ. And if you don't, let's just be honest. You, ne you made a false profession of faith. You never were saved. You didn't know the Lord. Remember in Matthew 7, which is a very uh, popular passage that Jesus talks about, He said, many will come to me in that day. Many. Many in that day when he's talking about the judgment, and they'll say, Lord, while well, we've cast out devils, we've done many wonderful works in thy name. Uh, they go on to talk about you know, how they've helped the needy and they've fed the hungry and they've done all these things. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. It wasn't that he knew them once, and they lost it, and then he knew them again. No, he said, I nev, 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 never knew you. N-E-V-E-R, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I don't know about you, but I'm going to make my calling and election sure. I'm going to be faithful in the house of God as long as I live. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to witness. I'm going to give of my substance. I'm going to put the Lord first. I may not have much, but whatever I do have, I'm going to honor God with it. Amen. Because it belongs, everything I have belongs to Him. I'm just a steward. And so He's entrusted, entrusted me with these blessings so that I can demonstrate that I trust Him. And I believe in him. I remember back when I was in Bible college and I was working for Fayette County School System and I was, I was only making about three twenty-five an hour. And really I didn't make enough money to, to I had a little car payment and I had to pay the insurance and all that. And when I got through paying my bills, I had no money for, for food. 
But I paid my tithes and offerings before I paid my car payment. And I put the Lord first because that's what the Bible teaches me to do. And I would trust God to provide for me for the rest of the week. A lot of times the ladies in the cafeteria would make me meals. And uh, Miss Quillen, the little lady that I roomed with, I had an apartment there. She would give me food. But uh, people say, well, I just, I can't, I got to pay my bills and I got to do all this. If you don't learn to put the Lord first, he can never trust you with the greater riches. The filthy mammon is the least. The Bible teaches us that, even though it's not our topic. But he tells us that uh, these things we are to constantly affirm if you are saved and maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now, notice that he says, These things I will, that thou affirm constantly. I will. Now, when we talk about the word will, one of the strictest sense, we talk about what we make, you know, at our death. We make out a will. We have, uh, uh, you know, we have decisions we make about what they're going to do with our body, a living will, when we die. And this word means that we are uh, to make this something that is a priority, it is something that we are to abide by. And he says, this is uh, the truth that we must proclaim. It's solid. It's reliable. And just as Titus was to proclaim these, so are we. Now let's take just a few minutes to look at these truths in a little more depth. The first thing that he mentions that we're going to talk about is in verse 3. He tells us there, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. You know, the Bible tells us that you can... You can look upon a man and be angry in your heart, even at your brother. And if you're angry uh, without a cause, uh, you can be guilty of committing spiritual murder. If you look upon your brother and you hate him without a reason, without any kind of cause, and uh, even if there's a cause, you shouldn't hate him. You ought to pray for him. Amen. The Bible teaches us, look, look at how God loves us. What if when we mess up, if God just quit loving us? What about if you had an evil thought? Or, or maybe you lost your temper for a minute. Or maybe you had a thought of foolishness. So he tells us here about man's depraved nature and the fact that man without God is on his way to a place called hell. He's lost and undone. What is he doing? Well, he's foolish. You remember how foolish you used to be before you were saved? You remember how you, the decisions you made and your dad and your mom said, don't do that, and you went right ahead and did them? You know how many times as parents we told our children, we tried to bring them up in the ways of the Lord, and they would, they'd say, well, I'm going to do this, and you'd say, don't do that. I'm telling you, you're, you're going the wrong direction. But they wouldn't listen. I know I, there, I did that some in my life for a little bit. And uh, he says we were disobedient. God demands perfect obedience. The Bible says if we keep all the law, yet we offend in one point, James says, we're guilty of the whole law. And the Bible says we were disobedient, we were deceived. I was deceived. I'll readily admit that. I thought it was my works that got me to heaven. I thought if I was better than other people that I'd make it to heaven. But what I didn't understand is that we don't compare ourselves to others. We have to compare ourselves with God. And God is perfect. Yeah, you may be able to pick out people that you, you seem to live better than they do, but that doesn't mean that that makes you righteous. 
because we need the righteousness of God. Remember Paul in Romans chapter uh, 9, he talked about his brethren, his kinsmen. He said they've gone about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's what I did. I'd say, well, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. I'm, I'm a pretty good boy. And so I thought I was okay. But when the Lord convicted my heart of sin and revealed to me through His Word, you see, the law is our schoolmaster. And the law shows us, you go to the Ten Commandments. Anybody here that wants to take a test on the Ten Commandments, uh, I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail. We've all failed. Because there's no one here who loves the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Nobody does. But God commands us to do that. Now you, you love him, but you don't love him the way you ought. I would dare say that there's nobody here that would say, well, I love the Lord every bit as much as I should. Now, I love the Lord. It's kind of like, you know, when Peter asked, Lord asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And he said, if you do, feed my sheep. And Peter wouldn't even say that he agapated him. He, called, he said, I do have a Philadelphia or Phileo brotherly love. But he said, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? That's the highest form of love. And so the first uh, doctrine or teaching we see is man's depravity. Now, if you don't believe that man is depraved, all you got to do is look around at the world today. Look at what's happening in our world today. Look at how people are living. They had a program on TV, uh, it was a police program, and uh, it's talking about this boy lived next door to a dear little lady. She didn't have a lot, she had a little money saved up, and he found out about the money she had, and one evening he broke in on her, and he not only killed her, but he did awful things to her, and he stole everything she had, took her little car, and just drove off and thought he was going to get away with it. Well, they caught him, and they gave him, I believe that was back in the time when they gave him the death penalty. And uh, look at the things that people do. Look at the things we've done. You know, uh, things that we, we've done that we regret, because the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, take a moment here with me in Ephesians 2 and look, the Bible says in verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to the church at Ephesus. And he says to them, You have been quickened, and before you were quickened, what were you? You're dead. Now, for those of you that like to explore words, you take a little bit and look at that word dead. Now, we all know what dead is. But the Greek word for dead is corpse. You, you know, when you go, when I was a little boy, I hated to go to the funeral home because I didn't like to look at, at people that were dead. It's frightened me. And uh, mom would tell me, son, you know, you need to go and, and pay your tribute. And I'd say, well, mom, I just don't want to go. I don't want to, I don't want to see that. But as I got older, I realized I had to. Well, he says, you were dead. Now, how were we dead? In trespasses. Now, let's take a minute and explore this. What does trespasses mean? Trespasses mean that you know better, but what do you do? You step over the line. You tell your, your grandson that you can mow the yard, but you don't go beyond this line here, son. You can mow anywhere up through here, over here, but do not cross here because you're getting close to the road. And you let him start mowing, and 30 minutes later you look out the window, and what's he done? He's crossed over the line. He's trespassed. That is why Israel had to bring a trespass offering. Every time they worshiped God, they brought a trespass offering for the things that they knew to be right. Remember the Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. Sin. Harmatha. 
missing the mark. We miss the mark. We, we want to do good. Paul admitted it in Romans chapter 6. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're in a battle. We're in a struggle with our flesh, with the world, and the devil. And, and, and it's not an easy thing to walk with God and, and to have a heart that is submissive to the will of God. He goes on and says, You were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. That is, you let the world set your standard. Don't let the world set your standard. Kathy bought me some clothes. And she was saying, now this one's in style. And I said, take it back. I don't want it. If it's in style, I don't want it. Don't bring me some kind of newfangled thing that the world is going crazy over. I don't want it. I really don't. And I like to dress okay. I like, you know, I don't want to be no big fancy dresser and spend a bunch of money on expensive clothes. Uh, just dress modestly and be thankful that you, you can dress and, and honor God. I believe we ought to try to honor the Lord, but I don't follow all these fads. Somebody was telling me, said, oh, you ought, to, you ought to cut you a little mustache, a mustache that just sort of grows right underneath and it, you can just barely see it and it looks like a little line. He said, oh, everybody's doing it. I said, I'm not doing it. You know, and you'll see these preachers on TV and they've got them beards cut. Just, I mean, they are cut right down to the line and they got them a little notch right here and boy, they're, they're right with the crowd. We don't have to dress like the world. We don't have to be like the world. In fact, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. So he says... We were following the course of the world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among also, we all had, notice that word conversation means your citizenship or the way you live in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, what were we? In the eyes of God? children of wrath, even as others. We remember what John the Baptist made very clear to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious folks. He said, you're all vipers. Your grandpa was snakes. Your dad was snakes. And he said, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And people looked upon them as the most elite of their day. They thought if there's anyone who is moral, it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But Jesus said, you're whited sepulchers. Outside you look good, but on the end you're full of dead men's bones. So these things we are to affirm. And we don't have time to go on and look at all this. And then the second thing we see in verse number 4 is talking about the, the mercy and the kindness of our Lord. For in Titus chapter, four, chapter 3 verse 4, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. We are to confirm and constantly repeat the fact that God is a God of love and mercy and kindness. We all know what John 3.16 says, how that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting, shall not perish but have everlasting life. And uh, another verse I would I'd draw your attention to is in the book of Romans, chapter 5, if you'll quickly turn there. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, he says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die for us? About 2,000 years ago, he died. 
But he knew. The Bible says he even knew our names. He knew every hair on our head. When I was lost, I didn't want God. I didn't want to be saved. I, I wanted to do my own thing. And that morning when I went to church and I heard the gospel and the Lord dealt with my heart, I want to tell you, if you don't get convicted of your sins, if the Lord don't convict you and show you what you are, uh, there's something wrong. He convicts you. And uh, he convicted me and showed me what I was. And the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we are to declare the loving kindness and the goodness and grace of Almighty God because the Lord is long-suffering and merciful. <clears throat> All I can say is when I look out at the world and what the world is doing, it just overwhelms me that God just don't strike people dead. I, I just can't understand for the life of me, but then I, I realize how patient and merciful and long-suffering God is. Notice even in the days of Noah, when Noah was building the ark some 120 years, and Noah was preaching, and warning him. But do you know that when Noah had preached all those years, the only people that got on the ark was his wife and his three sons and their wives. That would, that would be a total of eight members. The, the people that followed this great man, Noah, were eight people. And they were all family members. Not a single person outside of his family believed that what he was saying was true until the day the floods came and the waters swallowed them up. The third thing we see is how that God works in our salvation. Look at Titus chapter 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. According to his mercy, he saved us. Now here we see that uh, the Lord works in our heart uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And in the Gospel of John, uh, they've asked him this question about salvation. And uh, Nicodemus wants to know how to be saved. And he tells him in chapter uh, chapter 3, Notice verse number 3. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And as you know, I, I believe this is talking about the natural birth and the spiritual birth. It, it, the context shows that. Because you look at verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? That's the context. And Jesus said, except a man be born of the water. It's not talking about baptism. It's talking about the natural birth that we're born in the womb, the umbilical fluids that are uh, in, the in the womb of the mother. And when a mother's water breaks, the baby's born. And you're born of the word. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. Or he says, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that which is born of flesh is flesh. That can, you've got in verse 4 the confirmation of the context. And in verse 6 you've got the confirmation of the context. Now why would you come up with any other interpretation? Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. You've got to have a new birth. You've got to be changed. I have to hurry on here. And then we see the fullness of the blessings that we have in Christ. In Titus verse 6, notice he says quickly, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. What a standing we have in Christ. 
more than we could ever imagine. We've been adopted into the family. We've been made joint heirs with Christ. Now, folks, you have a lot of these word faith preachers today that preach that we're all little gods. And they go back to Genesis when God said, let us make man in our image. And they, they use this out of context. They say, well, everything produces after its likeness. So when God made man, what did he make? He made another God. No, he didn't. He clearly teaches that he made man. And man was made in his image. Body, soul, and spirit. But man is not a God. That's an old doctrine, an old heresy that's been around for at least 2,000 years. And these men are preaching this openly, this heresy. You're not a God. You're a child of God. You're born from above. And so we see that there are great blessings that we have in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us uh, about this. He says that these things that He has uh, heaped upon us abundantly. Uh, let me see if I can turn there real quick. Ephesians chapter 3. Excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. All of them. In heavenly places in Christ. Well, people say, well, Christ's not enough for me. I want to see visions. I, I want to jump pews. I, I want to do all these wild interpretations. You know, there are two men going to prison right now. One man, one woman who faked a man rising from the dead because they wanted to impress their congregation and build a congregation. And they hired this man to play like he was dead in a coffin and then they act like they raised him from the dead. Well, they proved it was fraud and now these people are going to prison for fraud. They've got all these people that want to show how spiritual they are and how much better they are than you. Let me tell you something. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And if that's not enough for you, my friend, you're searching in vain. Now, we also see the justification of all who believe, who are truly saved. And again, I'm not making excuses for those who claim to be saved and do not live the life that God expects them to live. Even the thief on the cross when he was saved, even though he didn't get baptized, he had more of a confession than many people have for many years of their life. He said, Lord, uh, you've done nothing amiss. I deserve this. You don't. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He condemned the other criminal uh, for his words, and this man, in his conversion, believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to read sometimes when I get down Romans 5, verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore being what? Justified by faith. How was Abraham justified? By faith. How was Noah? Noah was a friend of God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Therefore, being justified by faith, what do we have? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in what? Tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then last of all, we have the blessedness that is found in Christ for those who are redeemed. For he says in verse number 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And for the confirmation of that promise, take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 
we'll read verses 3 through 5. Of course, the whole chapter confirms it, but it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. These things, Titus, you are to constantly affirm. The most effective way to counteract error is to proclaim truth. I can't go out here and correct all the false teaching going on, but this is the most effective way to produce consistent and Christ-like Christians is by a simple and thorough explanation of an exposition of Scripture. The Word of God is sharp and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is quick. It is powerful. So we notice that this is God's instructions. This is God's plan for us that we might constantly confirm these things. Let's stand together. Amen.